Hey Andy, uh, so uh, happy to have you, um, you know, joining us today. Um, so uh, first off, uh, the Harbinger, awesome movie, uh, loved it. Um, actually, I think it was definitely one of my favorite of uh, Fantasia Fest. Um, so jumping right in, um, what uh, what was the uh, premiere of that movie like, and um, what was kind of like the re uh, audience reaction? Um, well, thanks for having me. Mike first, uh, this is awesome. The premiere was everything I could have wanted. I mean, probably when we started making the movie, if you would ask me like, if you could look into the future and like design your ideal premiere, I would have said Fantasia cause it's, it's just, it's my favorite film festival. I have a, you know, they've shown my last couple movies and I just love Mitch. I love the community spirit in, in Montreal and what drives that festival. Um, you learn over time that different festivals are driven by different things, uh, whether that's press or prestige or whatever. Like in Montreal, it's about love of film in the community and uh, it's a great feeling. So um, I also am notoriously terrified of premieres and uh, am always braced for the worst by the time I get there. So uh, the reception was this, uh, it's just delightful, you know, to be in the audience. What I felt in the audience is I felt them take the full weight of the movie on um, in a way that you almost forget about because you're making a horror movie. You get very technical in the last phases and you're really looking at the hills and valleys of the roller coaster ride. And then you're reminded sitting with an audience um, of the weight of the story and what you're asking them to take on. Um, and they took it completely on uh, and the focus was um, really intense. Uh, I thought it went great. Yeah, because uh, I mean, it's so interesting because I mean, when you create something, you're so almost right up against it that it's hard to sometimes take a step back, put yourself in the audience's shoes and kind of experience it through like their eyes. So that- Yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, uh, I guess like, um, I guess like the beats really hit as far as like when you wanted people to like, you know, scream and what, when you wanted people to kind of like um, intentionally laugh and all that good stuff. Um, yeah, no bad surprises there. I, I think, <laughs> I think, I think everything. Uh, it, it, I I know that as I go forward, every audience will be different. It's a strange thing the way they're all their own animals, and their audiences just show up and they need more comedy, so they find it, or they you know wherever they need pressure to to you know to be released. This was an audience that did not want to release the pressure, which is a good thing for this movie because neither does the movie. Yeah. Now, um, this is obviously a you know. COVID centric movie. Um, so, um, you know, I guess it was like, what part of the pandemic did you kind of have this uh, seed of this idea that you wanted to kind of, um, you know, bring to, to uh, this movie? It was pretty early. It was summer of 2020 um, where, I, and I had been hoping to shoot a different movie that summer that just wasn't it wasn't going to be possible. It wasn't going to be safe. So I was just another person whose plans were canceled at that point. Um, but I was also, I was having really bad nightmares, which is unusual for me. Um, and so that sort of led me into wanting to write about nightmares, even before I was thinking about using the pandemic as any sort of fuel for the story. Um, but then as during that time when we couldn't see the finish line and the, the sort of collective loss was mounting and you felt these sort of sad losses happening, you know, uh, in, in hospitals with where people couldn't go to the bedside. And, and um, I think that our usual sort of mortal fears get, you know, grew into something where like, it's the fear of being forgotten. Uh, the stakes were uh, rose at that point. And, and I was feeling the weight of that and wanting to incorporate that um, into the story again, to, to hopefully not write about it on the nose, but to, to take advantage of the fact that we all have this shared thing, 
um, usually what we share as audiences is regional to some degree, even historically. But um, this is something that everyone on the planet uh, can tap into for better or for worse. And you just have to be careful, I think, when you do, uh, that you're delivering the goods as well and that you're doing it with um, an element of, of grace and hopefully a bit of insight and catharsis and not just sort of exploiting it, you know? Yeah, no, that's, um, yeah, I, I think that it definitely um, doesn't feel, as you say, like exploitative. It definitely feels like it has something very relevant to say about the pandemic. And I think, you know, looking back on a movie like this, um, I feel like it will be pretty timeless because, you know, I, I love how you root the, this um very specific time and place into some very primal sort of emotions, fears, you know, there's something that is so universal, even outside of the pandemic, which I think is why I think like the movie is going to age exceptionally well. I, I love how you walk that like a very fine line with that. Cool. Thank you. I, I appreciate part of it. And I mean, it's it's like something that I noted in my review, but I love how just throughout your entire filmography, you you uh, always kind of aim for the more cerebral horror or like the something that's a little more like on an existential level, which I kind of I, I really appreciate. Like I like um, I don't know if you can tell, but I kind of like movies, so I I, I kind of like a wide spectrum, but there is uh, a big part of me that likes a kind of thinking man's, uh, you know, horror movie. Um, but I, and, you know, I like how you go that route, but then there's like the pulpy kind of horror elements that are always kind of fun and enjoyable. So, um, you know, I, I, are you kind of always aware of having that balance of, of, you know, making it cerebral, but also kind of keeping it a little bit um, fun or, you know, like the true spirit of the genre. Yeah, I do. I, I, I always have that balance. In my, I always feel like I'm dealing with like uh, the, the, the contemporary me who's, you know, who's, who's got ideas and, and you know, uh, something to say or something to let go of that, that means something to me. And then there's like the 12 year old me who matters even more to me in my heart like the one that fell in love with movies to begin with um and uh, has uh, certain needs and expectations especially from horror movies that uh I, I always need to be keeping in mind i mean i think i'm playing that game slightly on on the budget levels i've been working with it it honestly it makes sense to get my more cerebral work out in this space because it's what's achievable um i think people would be surprised by the other scripts i have um, which are not all in that vein, but um, require more resources for me to actually do. Nice. Um, yeah, and that's, uh, again, it's something else I noted in my review is like this movie, like I know it's made on a mod modest budget, which I don't think is a bad thing, but but the, the amazing thing is it looks incredible. Like I've seen movies that probably cost triple the amount that didn't look as good. Um, I'm assuming that kind of comes from just cutting your teeth in these like low budget, like scrappy kind of horror movies, you know, making every kind of scent count. Yeah, surrounding myself with incredible talent has a lot to do. Like just, um, uh, I, I mean, plug. I'm very plugged in through my producer, Richard King, um, through a, a network of like AFI people. I've, I've through that network of, very talented people i've worked with some great dps but none better than um than ludo uh isadori who who shot this movie and was uh uh i was constantly as as much as we had an amazing experience designing all these shots together and getting the look i wanted i was just constantly surprised at uh at the ideas that would come to set every day to elevate that all the way through to post and to color um there there was there was a lot of uh good eyes working on this and and if you're smart about you know your your collaborations and 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 uh hiring your department heads um yeah that doesn't always just come down to money that that that, that thankfully comes down to just talent and and uh great collaborative spirit and it was a super warm set for such a cold movie it was like a very it was a nice place to come to work every day yeah, no, that's great. Like I said, it's just, it's visually, it's so like it, it really sets 
the, the tone and the mood and I just really like how um, everything felt very thought out like it didn't just feel like sort of an afterthought like I, I see so many screeners and you know I won't call anything out in particular but like you can kind of tell when things were done on the fly and then you can kind of tell when things were sort of meticulously planned out um, so um, this is kind of an exciting time for you because not only um, you have this new movie coming out, which as I say is amazing, but uh, you know, going back to uh, where it all began, uh, you know, Yellow Brick Road uh, getting a up. So this is the up updated special edition. So now I was kind of curious, like what makes it the updated? What was sort of changed uh, from this to the previous? It's mostly that there are some VFX that were kind of redone or, or done better or added to the mostly on the part of Jesse, uh, my co-director on the film who also did the VFX. Um, he went in and fixed some things that, uh, you know, it was pretty, I mean, pretty scrappy at the time. We, we were on our first film, we didn't know, uh, we, we've learned a lot since then, let's put it that way. So there were some things that um, we both thought could look better and he took the time to really, get it right. And then on top of that, there was a bunch of um, features and extra things we hadn't shown anyone over the years that, you know, was a good reason to, to, to go back. But yeah, it's sort of crazy to have these two things happening at once. It's forcing me to look at the, the whole, <laughs> the whole span is in front of me. And it's, uh, it's been cool. It's, it's, it's been cool looking back and, and, and um, just realizing that, uh, that 10 years later or more than 10 years later, like that, that's a movie that, that still matters enough to a subset of our community that, yeah. that, uh, that they want a special edition, which is super cool. Um, because that's what I'm proud of about that movie. I think, I think we just made a big swing uh, with that movie. It was very ambitious. Um, we swung for the fences and did something that feels still feels surprising, I think, and, um, super original, uh, whether no matter which side you know uh, an, an audience member may fall into whether like I've gotten equal amounts of like death threats and love letters about Yellow Brick Road but that's sort of what's beautiful about Yellow Brick Road and why it kind of cut through the noise um, so it's been very cool revisiting it and, and um, I'm really yeah. happy to have a blu-ray of it finally with a good oh, transfer yeah. it looks great like I and it's so funny because uh, I was like listening to a podcast you did about like how you were also saying about there was not a lot of middle ground. You either kind of loved this movie or you hated it. But I, I think that's kind of like, as you say, like kind of the beauty of it, because like it's not boring. You you have a visceral reaction, whether it's good or bad. Yeah. Um, and I think like a movie should at least just not be boring. And I was not bored with this. I enjoyed the <laughs> hell out of it. Um, and uh, yeah, like I was so st uh, stoked to be able to talk about it on the video attic. And uh, as I said, we're doing the giveaway. Yeah, and, thank um, you. Yeah, so um, now um, is it kind of too early to talk about like um, your latest film getting a home video release? It's probably yeah i'll let i'll let those announcements but the, that, that will all be coming soon um in terms okay. of those those announcements um uh here in north america through through xyz films that part is known but in terms of what they're doing in the timeline i think i, I think very soon they'll be rolling all that out um but um but anybody that wants it on home video will uh eventually get that i don't know for sure I, I I won't speak out of school, but I think so. It looks okay. it looks positive that that will also be an option. It's important to me. I have you know when I'm I'm in like a a temporary rental right now, but I'm when I'm in my proper office, my background <laughs> looks much like yours. Oh, nice. I'm missing all my movies are in storage. It's terrible. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I um, I always joke, but like, yeah, I love supporting um, physical media. I love supporting indie horror directors, like. Um, that's why I kind of like love talking to, and I get really excited to talk to, um, like people that are, are, I think making some of the most exciting, uh, stuff in the genre, because it's like things that 
you know, you don't really have to go through a committee or a marketing thing to come up with these ideas. You can just say something really interesting without, you know, uh, cutting through all that sort of studio stuff. Um, and I, like kind of having said that, like if you were given the option, if you were given like a blank check, let's say to make a big studio movie, but you know, still in like the horror genre, would that be something you'd be interested in or do you kind of more like the, the indie horror scene? I like it all, but no, I'm looking, I'm looking to do more. Um, I, I mean, if I had a blank check, I would take, there's a couple of my scripts that are the, the that uh, are bigger ideas that require more and that that would be my dream to, to just continue to do my own stuff. Um, but I also feel like I, you know, I would be really exciting to develop a take on a pre-existing franchise. Uh, I'd be interested in, you know, in adaptations of, you know, from authors or whatever that I'm in. Like I'm into all of it. I just want it to be in horror. That part I'm, um, and that surprises some of the people in my life because I came up in theater um, and, you know, I had a theater company in my twenties. We were not doing horror. We were doing, you know, comedies and dramas, but I always had horror in my head. And I just think, I, I'm in love with the community and I think that the boundaries of the genre are so wide and welcoming at this point. There's just nothing I can't explore within horror. There's nothing, there's, there's nothing you can't write about through that lens. Um, so I, I, I just think that part of it is, um, feels certain to me that I want to stay in horror, but beyond that, yeah, I'm open. I'm ready to do more. All right. Let's like put it out there in the universe. Please. Let's yes. get you a big studio job. Like send it out. <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I think that's such a great point though, because you know, the horror genre is such a wide reaching and diverse genre. And I also think it's like a genre that you can say a lot of things um without it becoming like maybe preachy. Like it, it's a good template for really anything kind of that's going on in society right now. Like, you know, I feel like your films like take advantage of that with, with within the genre, uh, which I really appreciate. Um, so um, yeah, now wrapping up, is there any um, like exciting new projects that you can talk about or mention or anything upcoming you wanted to um, plug? I wish I were brave enough, but the point is that I, I, I have to like, be the person with the boring answer to this question because I have become so jaded that I am like superstitious to the point that if I if I even put anything else out there that's specific, um, uh, it, it it will come out from under me in, in some way because <laughs> I've spent a long it's been a long twisty road to get to this point. But I will say, I have um, for me the the pandemic was a you know like a lot of people it was a a chance to have a a surge of, of writing. I was in a lot. Um, and I have a, a stack of scripts that I'm really excited to shoot. And they are all, they are really in all corners because I like, I, I like to think I can sort of have my take on each sort of subgenre. I feel like I've been bouncing around a bit. I've, I have a few in the demonic realm, like Yellow Brick Road and Harbinger, and I have a few ghost stories, but, um, I've got like something that's more of a slasher. I've got a horror comedy that's like high school coming of age and voodoo. Um, I've got like a ice road truckers, sort of more like a thriller sort of thing. Um, so there's a lot uh, I'm ready to go with. And I've got a lot of um, a lot of reason to be optimistic. I'll have good announcements soon. So you should follow me on Twitter um at Andy Benton and hopefully I'll be announcing cool things soon but that's as far as I'm willing to go now but the gods will strike me down <laughs> yeah and I will uh I, I will put a link uh to your socials in the description but y'all should be following Andy like his stuff is amazing um again this was uh, a blast talking to you I've been such a huge fan so this has been really cool and uh also y'all want to check this out it is awesome. It is stacked. Um, this is a really awesome release. Like I had a blast going through all the the, the extras. Um, it's so. fun. There's a little PTSD in there for me, but it's it's fun. <laughs> My wife and I watched it last week. My wife, I'm I'm I Laura Heisler, who's in the movie uh, as Liv, the the town girl, the 
the Barry girl is like, we met on that set and we wow. are, are married and have two kids now. Um, she's the demonologist with the two kids you see in the Harbinger. They're, um, oh, yeah, they're in maybe. that movie as well. So it's, yeah, beyond just the movie and, the, and seeing the whole span of my career. I mean, that movie defined the course of <laughs> my personal life and everything else. So um, it was a big deal for a lot of us. And uh, I think it's cool for the whole team to be looking back on it. So I appreciate you guys doing the giveaway and, and offering yeah. the support. That's awesome. And also, I just, that kind of made me think about how, um, I, I know I said this in my review, but I thought it was so brilliant to do like the demonologist on, uh, you know, a, a Skype call with like kids in the background that was so genius. I, I, I love that. Thanks, man. <laughs> like, <laughs> Appreciate it. Like I, when I saw that, I was like, all right, yes, I, I'm with this. I'm here for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, um, so yeah, gosh, thank you so much again. Like this thank is such you, a blast. Mike. And um, like I said, uh, y'all should pick up this uh, Blu-ray. I will put a link in the description where you can get that. And then I will uh, put where you can follow Andy on his socials. And uh, as always, uh, thanks for hanging out with us. Thank you so much. We appreciate it.